Well, hey, my name is Ryan, and you're watching Kratos Sound Lab. It's a weekly video show with recording tips, pointers, and off-the-wall recording techniques. Well, I'm sorry I missed last week's episode. I was sick, and because of the, um, the amount of time that it takes to record, edit, and upload the footage, I just wasn't able to do it. But this week, I have something special for you. I wanna show you kind of behind the scenes and really the materials that you're gonna need to build the sound panels that I have around here at the studio. If you just know where to look and kind of what to shop for, certain terms to be searching for, then it makes it a lot quicker to find this stuff to really put some of these sound panels together for your own. And it really does make a difference. You can really make an unusable space completely usable and really make a great recording space. Now, one thing to consider before trying to treat any space that you have is really the size and the dimension of the space. The ceiling height definitely comes into place as well. So you wanna kinda of look at the dimensions, look at how the, the walls are angled even, look at uh, where you have things lined up against the wall, such as bookshelves and closet doors and things like that. You really have to look at the space as kind of a, a blank slate and decide is it really a good candidate for trying to treat and trying to record it. Now, if you, you don't have any other choices, then really what you have to do is, is almost over-treat the room, because what happens is, is the high frequencies get taken care of first and the low frequencies tend to still kind of hang around. You end up having to pretty much make it a pretty dead room. But if you can treat, say, something like a family room or a large room in your house, then you really can have a lot to work with and you can get at super high quality drum sound with a little bit of tail, you know, reverb on the snare and nobody would ever know that you weren't in a real studio. And so that's really the kind of size room that, that I find optimum. Uh, this room here is about the size of a family room. Uh, it's uh, 15 feet by 25 feet. Um, I don't know what the metric conversion um, of that would be but it's 15 by 25 and uh, 12 feet high. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of volume of air in the room. And so with that volume comes the ability for sound to just kind of scatter and develop and, and, and do all the good things that we want sound to do. It's not contained to where it, it clutters in on itself, but it's actually able to develop a nice room sound. And without the sound panels, of course, it's really too bright. It's too, there's, there's too much of, you know, flutter and all these sorts of things that we don't want in a room. But with some sound panels that I'm gonna show you how to build today, it really can be a nice room. And this room still is a little bit bright. Um, I could still add and kind of tune the room a little bit. And I could also add some, you know, corner, uh, you know, bass traps and things like that. So it's a work in progress, okay? But this is really the start of good recordings, okay? It's not that you fix it in the mix. It's really that you need to fix it at the mic or fix it at the room, okay? So if, uh, if you're getting too much um, flutter, if you're getting uh, too much splashy sounds and high end out of your cymbals, perhaps you need to add a few rugs in the room or add a few sound panels. Okay, so these sound panels are really tuning the room. We're actually starting our EQ process now. We're starting it in the room. We're tuning it. We're shaping the sound. And so we don't have to try to eliminate these later with, you know, really sharp Q, um, you know, reductive EQs that are, you know, problem areas. So uh, instead of fixing it in the mix, we're gonna fix it today with sound panels. Let's check, let's check out some of these sound panels and I'll show you kind of the basics of what they are. So these are my main sound panels. These are two inches thick and uh, they're just kind of my general purpose sound panels. I have others that are uh, six inches thick, four inches thick. All I'm really doing is doubling up this material that I'm using here. Let me go ahead and take this down from the wall so you really see uh, how this thing is made. Okay, so it's not very pretty, but then again, it is the back of this panel and nobody really ever sees this. You can see that originally I had these painted white, now they're black. I mean, these things have, have really um, given me a lot of good use over the years. And really the main 
uh, the main element of this is this Owens Corning 703. Uh, they make some thicker stuff like 705, but the 703 is, uh, I believe, uh, three pounds per cubic foot. And basically what this does is it acts as the absorber. You'll notice that it doesn't have a back to the panel. And so what I'm trying to get the sound to do is basically go through this panel and get trapped between it and the wall. So I'm actually raising it. I'm allowing it to actually hang a little bit off the wall a little bit. And the sound basically comes through the panel, bounces against the wall, and kind of gets trapped in there. At some points uh, in the past, I've actually put little spacers back here so that the panel is consistently, you know, two to three inches out from the wall. I've even made these chain, uh, chains longer. Um, but really, it's about um, getting the, the panel to basically be kind of semi-permeable so that the sound can go through it and kind of get trapped behind it. This, uh, this panel, um, like I said, it's only two inches, so it's not going to get too many low frequencies, but it'll get pretty much the mid-range through the highs. The low frequencies are really best treated um, at even more space from the wall and with thicker material. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but for for this sound panel, the basic construction is is I just did a a wooden frame and glued and st uh, and Brad nailed it in and then painted it and put a support beam right here for the uh, the eye hooks, okay, and twisted that in there. I, I drilled it, then twisted it in there, and then I put the a uh, couple lengths of black chain on. This black chain is what I use for everything. It's thin enough that you can actually pry it apart with pliers to uh, make it whatever size you want. So when you find, you know, say if you want 10 lengths um, of chain that gives you maybe the measurement that you want, okay, a foot or whatever, then you can pry apart that tenth, that tenth link and take out the rest of the chain and put it back together and you have exactly 10 lengths of chain. So it's just thin enough you can modify the length and it holds, I don't know, it, it holds enough pounds that it's really not going to break. Uh, it's, you know, easily um, more, than, more, than, more than enough to hold the, the weight of this panel. Now, price goes, um, I got six of these boards of the 703, and they're kind of like uh, about as rigid as like styrofoam or something. You can definitely rip them apart. Um, you could try to put a screw into them, but it's just going to kind of crumble if you pull on the screw. So, you know, I decided to build these panels so that it'd be nice and strong. So you can get six of these guys for about 100 bucks if you live here in the U.S., um, I'll put the link and stuff wherever I got all this stuff in that PDF that's downloadable for today. Um, but I'll, you know, if, if you know where to find this stuff, it's pretty easy. Uh, the shipping is about a third of the cost, but with shipping, it was about a hundred bucks for six of these panels. So you're looking at about, I don't know how the math comes out, about 15 bucks, I think, uh, 17 bucks for just the panel, then another couple bucks for the wood. Uh, you know, maybe a dollar for, you know, the two, you know, uh, pieces of hardware and the chain. Um, then I got some burlap. That'd be a couple bucks um, just at a fabric store that I had used to secure it. I used um, roofing nails, and it's just basically made for, like, tar paper, but instead uh, it's just holding the burlap in. So that's what I used. Um, if I had to do this again, I really wouldn't do this. Uh, actually, here's one of the, the pieces here. So you can see there's little ridges, uh, you know, on the nail itself. And of course, a, a, a nice fat washer that's plastic to hold in. And um, like I said, if, if I did this again, I really wouldn't do this way. Um, I thought it'd be cool to have like painted frames. Really, I probably would just get black fabric, stretch it over the frame, and staple it right here and call it a day. That's really what I would do. That way I don't have to worry about uh, you know, pulling it from behind and getting, getting wrinkles out. 
Um, those are things that really um, added to the time of making these panels. Uh, these guys, I mainly just put in the first re reflection point, meaning it's, it's the point right at where sound is first going to hit. So if I'm setting up a drum set, what's the first wall the sound's going to hit? Well, these guys are going to go up. And like I said, I try to space them out. You know, you can, you can put little spacers behind them. The more you're able to space it out, the more frequency, low frequency, you're going to actually get. So that's actually the, the ideal. Um, sound, if it's going to resonate between two walls, the, um, it's kind of impractical, but if you have a really bad frequency that is not leaving you alone, then the best point to kill that frequency if it's resonating between those two walls is at the 25% or the 75% distance. So about a quarter of the way out from the walls is where you're going to really kill the frequency that's giving you a trouble with a sound panel. Now that's not really practical. Um, you know, if you have a 10 by 10 bedroom, um, I don't see many people doing sound panels that are two and a half feet, um, which is 25% out the distance away from your wall. That means that you would be operating in a space that's only five feet wide. Um, so you lose half of your, you know, the width of, of your room. But where, where this is practical is in something like a ceiling cloud. Um, and that's where I'll take you to next and really show you how I've designed the cloud. Really simple design just like this but it's all in the placements and uh, the placement and the distance from that ceiling. Okay, so we're here in the control room. This is right above my desk. You can kind of see the uh, edges of the, the speakers here. And really the desk is, you know, right here. I don't have a whole lot of room. It's, it's a pretty tight space. When I stand by my desk, I can actually reach up and touch the ceiling. So, I mean, it's really a little bit lower than ideal, but the way that I've combated this issue is by putting a sound panel at about 25% the way down from the ceiling. Now luckily, you know, it doesn't cut into where I'm going to stand. Uh, it actually does get a about where the, the height of my head would be if I were to go over my desk, but I never walk over my desk, you know, I typically walk around my desk, so it's not an issue. But uh, what this is doing is it is it is killing a frequency at its strongest point, and therefore this panel is able to, to do the most work. And if I were to try to put this right up on the ceiling, it wouldn't be nearly as effective. The, uh, the, the frequency that was giving me the problems would be almost in, invisible to this panel. You just wouldn't see it. And if I put it at about halfway, same kind of thing. The, the, uh, the sound wave is at its most, I think the term is velocity at basically 90 degrees, 270 degrees. Uh, that's a mathematical term for the cycle of a wave. But for the terms that you need to know, it's basically just 25% of the way down. So if it's an eight foot high ceiling, that means you're hanging a panel two feet down. Now, one of the things that I like to do is instead of just hanging it uh, exactly two feet down or whatever 25% of my, my height is, is I like to do it at a an angle. So I'm just kind of getting a, a, a wide range of frequencies from, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 hertz all the way up to 120, even though my problem frequency might be 115 or something. So this way I can kind of really smooth out that whole range of problem frequencies. Maybe I'm hearing a bunch of peaks, you know, maybe a bass guitar note of G is giving me problems, maybe a high tom of maybe a 12 inch tom is really giving me a problem and it's just really screaming loud. And so what I'm doing is I'm kind of getting a few different frequencies by tilting the panel. I'm blocking frequencies that at their highest point would be at this distance and at their highest point being more like this distance, okay? So just kind of getting a range of frequencies, kind of building in some um, kind of forgiveness as far as the accuracy of the measurements and all the different things in the room. Frequencies also um, bounce off the desk itself. It's just another good reason to kind of angle things. Um, this is kind of an old sc school way of doing it. Um, I guess I guess in you know like the 70s they would angle their panels and um, 
I've seen drawings of, you know, arrows coming from, you know, here and bouncing back to the engineer's head. And I don't really think of it as an angle bouncing frequencies like, like this. I don't think of it like that. I think of it as the, the whole room is involved with frequencies. And this is literally like a net that is catching those bad frequencies. Um, it does catch the high frequencies as well, but I'm really trying to catch the low frequencies as much as I can. I'm gonna move the camera around to um, the, the back of this so we can really see how it's constructed. Okay, so we're looking here over the, uh, over the desk cloud here. And um, really there's a lot of extra fabric here I mean, this stuff is just a real pain in the butt. Um, I totally, if, if doing this again, I'd definitely just wrap, uh, you know, some black fabric over this instead of having to wrap individually the pieces of 703 and then sink them in. Um, so this is just one more reason why I would just wrap the fabric, staple it to the edge here, and just cut off the excess. Um, but you can see, basically, I'm doing the same technique. You know, wood frame, uh, Owens cording 703, um, shingle uh, nails or you know or roofing nails and then I've also added a piece of the 703 just laying it up there just trying to thicken the spots that I think needs you know needs it the most to try to get some of the low end ideally um, I would probably rebuild this panel make it six inches thick um, you know I, I, I don't think there's uh, too much that, that could be done um, you know, you can always do more, I think, for controlling low frequencies and just getting resonant points, you know, out of the way. Um, if anything, there's, there's always an issue of just low end bouncing around the room. And so um, I've never worried about doing too much low end treatment. Maybe if you're really high end and uh, you had really good materials and I guess you could kill the low end. But um, for my cases, I'm really never worried about doing too much treatment for the low end. Uh, it's always something I'm chasing down and trying to get under control. You can see that I'm using the chain links here. And you know, this is a great way also to hang a panel from the ceiling. Um, you basically make the, the links of chain so that um, they actually come out to, to over the length, over the edge of the panel here. And what that means is that when you're holding the panel, um, when you're trying to hold it up to the ceiling, it's gonna hang like a flag, and you're gonna need the chain to be basically reaching out over the edge here. And then you're gonna basically hang the the first hooks, and then you'll have to run around, you know, run around with your ladder to the other side, and it's gonna be hanging flat like this, and you'll have to basically run around and tilt it up like that, hook these back to, and then kind of go back and forth you know, move it up two or three lengths at a time until you get the height and the angle that you want. Okay, here's an example of the two inch thick frames that I made. You can see that it's not fully occupied by the 703. I've actually had to uh, rob some of it out and uh, make a new panel out. So it's, it's actually always adaptable, which is the nice things about these. Um, if you need the paneling, you can always rob some of the thickness out of the others and you have, you know, double the panels. But this obviously is made for two inch thick um, 703 here. I've added these vents just to further increase the, the amount that sound can really go in and around these panels. The idea is that uh, the wood frames are really not uh, there. They're just for structural support. They acoustically shouldn't be doing anything. They shouldn't interfere with what the 703's job is to basically intercept that sound. So I cut these out. You know, it looks kind of cool, but then again, it's it's a little extra work to do it. Uh, it's up to you if you'd want to do something like that. Um, but then again, this is probably one of the reasons why I wanted to cover the 703 with fabric and leave the frames because I kind of got carried away with the idea of making them, you know, look cool. To be honest, you know, if this were just covered up with fabric and stapled acoustically, that have the same purpose the same functionality, it just wouldn't be visually as, uh, as interesting. Here we can see that they're spaced out from the wall and this is really giving us the effect of a much thicker panel here. So instead of just two inches against the wall flat, we're getting, you know, eight inches here. Okay, eight inches of interaction with the wall. This is a little bit slanted 
and that's fine. You know, just the same theory as the the clouds over the desk. Um, you know, I, I like the slant. I like to have kind of that uh, kind of range of frequencies that it's capturing. This right here would be much different than uh, studio foam that you buy. Uh, studio foam that you buy would be right up against the wall, and it it really is more for high frequencies in cases that you can't build a panel. Um, so maybe like really tight hallways, um, places around a door perhaps, maybe on the back of a door. Um, you know, something like that would be great for studio foam. But for general purpose, I, I've always built sound panels and you can do them for really cheap. So this is a good example of some of the thicker panels that I've done. Uh, the six inch panel, the, the three layer deep one, uh, is just a little bit deeper and the hole's a little bit wider. And that's really the only difference. Okay, so that was pretty much the rundown of the sound panels. And if you want a full list of all the materials that I use, you can find a free download at my website. You can just click the link right here on the screen. And if you sign up for my email list, you'll get that shopping list and you'll get every other item that I'm giving away each week. So you're gonna get basically the whole pool of different stuff. Also, don't forget to check out the details on my recording school. I'm starting this month. It's a really cool program. You can be a part of it from anywhere in the world. I've already had questions asked about, well, you know, I'm overseas in a different country. What about me? Well, you know, it is mostly video based with live video meetings and a lot of assignments that you can do there at home. Also, there's files you can download to get hands-on experience with the sounds I'm creating here and try to replicate those sounds there at your studio. And also the ability to mix the same songs that I work with and show in these episodes. Uh, I don't have the ability to give all the files to all of YouTube, but for the recording school, I make that exception and I have permission from the artist to do so. So you can actually practice mixing with the real files. So definitely check that out. So if you have any questions on any of this stuff, make sure to comment below and make sure to reply to every comment that I get. You can also email me at ryan at creativesoundlab.tv. I'll see you next week.